Well, it's great to be here on this Lord's Day to worship with one another. And in that worship, to seek to honor and glorify God. And I know if our attitude is right, where it needs to be, then we'll leave this place realizing, knowing, and feeling confident that we've been blessed to be here. And that God has been honored, and we've all been encouraged and edified and taught and ready to face a new week, beginning on this Lord's Day, a week of faithfulness and hopefully a Christ-like influence upon others. I'd like to call your attention this morning as we begin our lesson to the theme and the title, Fightings Within. Fightings Within, the church at Corinth. Opposition was faced by the Apostle Paul in virtually every place where he took the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, he refers to that opposition in Macedonia, where in writing to the church in Corinth, he says, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Fightings without, fears within, was what Paul faced. Sometimes from unbelieving Jews, at other times, opposition came from hostile civil authorities. But more importantly, in reference to the opposition that Paul observed, he recognized in some churches that they were standing in opposition to the laws of Christ. To those things that he had, by inspiration, revealed to them as the laws of Christ, the gospel of Christ. They were not living up to the gospel of Christ. And the Corinthian church is certainly a case in point. Their reputation, for example, was one that was maybe the reason why Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians in the first place. In 1st Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul writes, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of the poor's household, that there are contentions among you. So their reputation for being contentious, for having problems that went beyond being contentious, was apparently known in other places. I don't know exactly where Chloe was from. Was she from Corinth? Uh, or was she from Ephesus, where Paul was when he wrote this letter? We're not really sure. But she knew about the problems, and Paul knew about it when he was in Ephesus writing these books, at least the first book. 1 Corinthians. So the Corinthian church was certainly a church that had internal problems and issues. And answering and attending to those problems and issues is really the focus of both 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The Corinthian church had problems and Paul had to attend to those problems. So Paul in 1st and 2nd Corinthians addresses those problems. But he's also addressing not only the problems of the church in Corinth, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, as he introduces this letter, he says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus, first through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He's clearly pointing out that the church in Corinth is not the only church for whom these instructions are intended. The church in Corinth is not the only church that had problems and issues that we want to talk about today. He recognized that problems and issues were part of every church. He says to the saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. So he recognized that he was addressing problems that could crop up in any church back at that time, and even to this very day, churches experience and deal with the same problems that Paul dealt with and that the Christians in Corinth dealt with back in that day, 2,000 years ago. So both these letters address the problems and the issues that not only the church in Corinth had to deal with, but that you and I have to deal with as well in this church 
and in other churches, every church around the world, shares to some extent the same problems that the church in Corinth had to deal with. The problems that they dealt with, that Paul addresses, and I think I'm going to list 11 all together, not all of them in today's lesson. I'll probably divide this lesson up into three different parts. I don't want to go too fast. I want to hit every point as clearly and precisely as I can. But uh, the problems and temptations and the sins that they dealt with is not really the focus of what Paul has to say. His focus is placed on how they dealt with these various issues, the sins, the temptations, and so forth. For example, the immoral brother that was a part of the church there. That was a problem in Corinth, obviously, but it's also a problem in many other churches, both in the first century as well as today. Paul's emphasis in writing 1 Corinthians in reference to that problem of the immoral brother is not his problem, but it was the focus on how they dealt with the problem, how they handled it. And as it turns out, they were indifferent toward that immoral brother, even to the point where they were puffed up or proud in some perverted way in reference to that sin. How about the personal loss that people experience on the part of their brothers and sisters in Christ, as First Corinthians chapter 6 points out, where they were taking one another to court because of personal injuries that may have cost somebody some money or some property or maybe some reputation. That The problems that they were experiencing are not even mentioned in 1 Corinthians 6. How they dealt with the problem is mentioned. They did not deal with the problem in the right way. Paul told them, you need to appoint a mediator from among yourselves, even the least prominent among you, the least esteemed, and settle the problems in-house, as it were. Instead, they would take one another to the civil courts to solve a problem that had to do with brothers and sisters in a particular congregation. Or how about the uh, differences of opinion that are addressed in chapter 10, uh, verses 14 beginning, where brothers had differences of opinion in reference to matters of liberty. Paul dwells in that context upon how those issues are dealt with not so much on the issue itself of eating meat, things of that nature, but how do they deal with it? And so that's the great lesson in 1 and 2 Corinthians. Every church experiences pressures and problems and temptations, they're going to be there. But how we handle those situations, those difficulties, those divisions, those contentions, those differences of opinion, that's what we want to focus on as well, because that's what Paul focuses on here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in particular. So such issues, as we're going to discuss today, are common in all churches. We're going to begin taking a look at these issues one at a time. As I mentioned, I've listed set 11 on again. There are probably more. But the first one I want to call your attention to is that this church had a problem with carnality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 through chapter 4 and verse 21, this problem is discussed. One way in which they were suffering from carnality and immorality is also being dealt with in this section. But immorality is just another form of carnality. Carnality is a little more general than a specific area of immorality. So they had a carnal or fleshly or materialistic mind. In reference to how they dealt with many of these issues, as we're going to notice, so they do overlap from one extent to another in terms of what you might call them immorality or carnality or whatever. All that they did probably had something to do with carnality. But this was a mindset that was fleshly in nature. And one way in which it was expressed was in the fact that they exalted men. Some men were exalted more than others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 6, for example, Paul warns them, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So he warns them about being puffed up, because of pride in one particular person more than another. 
Maybe they had pride in Apollos and they wanted to follow him. They had pride in Paul or in Cephas and they decided to follow them and look down upon the other individuals and other Christians who follow the others. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, chapter 1, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and uh, verses 27 and 28, he also says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to th shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing things that are. He's talking about their habit and their practice of exalting men or exalting human wisdom above another. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, he talks about the fact that this uh, carnal attitude was expressed, as I've already mentioned in reference to uh, the uh, work of Paul and Cephas and Apollos among the Christians there. And they were exalting one another. They were, uh, as I mentioned, had pride in their various relationships, which not only exalted some more than they should be exalted, and looked down upon others when they shouldn't have been looked down upon. The work that Paul and Cephas and Apollos did with regard to the church of Corinth, Paul described it as uh, I planted a polished water, but God gave the increase. He's pointing out that planting is important in teaching the Word of God to a group of people that need the gospel. Watering is also important, but he points out primarily that it is God who gives the seed that's preached its living properties and potential to bear fruit. That's God behind that. No man should be exalted above what God has commanded us to do. And the way God estimates us. We're workers in the vineyard of God. We might be planters. We might be waterers. But God is the important one. And it is he who receives the glory. Just like Paul says there, as I mentioned, beginning in verse uh, chapter 1, skip verses 10 and 11. But look at verse 12 where Paul says, Now I say this, if each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul be uh, crucified for you, or you baptized in the name of Paul. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Christus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I have baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptize any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of that none effect. Several times in these few verses, Paul talks about Christ. Paul was not crucified for these people. Christ was. Paul was not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel of Christ. Anyone can do the baptizing. The church was based upon Christ as a son of God. He's the important one. And Paul tries to point that out to the people here. Don't extol one another as being more important than another. Don't look down upon us. We're all working. We're all together. We're all imperfect human beings. The glory should be given to God. If the seed is planted, give God the glory. If the seed is watered, give God the glory. If the seed grows and produces fruit, give God the glory. It does not belong to me. So the people here in Corinth had a problem with exalted men. That was the expression of their carnality. Furthermore, they exalted human wisdom. I read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, and 28, where Paul explains that the foolish things God has chosen to put shame to the wise. That is, the world be wise. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. He's contrasting there the spiritual things of God that God has set in place with the wisdom of man. And the Bible tells us that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. 
So the wisdom of man is nothing to extol, or nothing to be proud of, or nothing to put up as that objective which I follow. There may have been some in the church there in Corinth that were more educated than others. And they may have taken pride in their worldly wisdom, their worldly knowledge, their worldly education. And Paul says you've misplaced your praise, your exaltation. It's not to be given to men, but and not to worldly wisdom, but it's to be given to God. And there's numerous warnings throughout the scriptures, of course, about this. I think that most departures from the faith, not only in reference to the church in Corinth, but in reference to churches today, in some way or another are based on human wisdom. They're based upon human philosophy. They're based upon uh, or influenced by modern philosophy. For example, the modern philosophy of modernism, which says that God does not exist, which says that there's no all-powerful, miracle-working God that works within the realm of man. Even in the New Testament time, they deny the efficacy of the miracles that Christ and the apostles performed. Well, that leads into the church, where people lose respect for God to one extent or another because of the influence of this modern philosophy of modernism or the emphasis on secular education. That's affected many churches where they won't have anything to do with a preacher that's not got a, a BA or a, maybe a MA or a PhD. Either. So we place emphasis upon education sometimes. And we want to increase the growth of this church and the influence of this church. Well, some people say, by, well, we need more educated people. We need more people with uh, greater Bible knowledge or greater worldly knowledge. We need more highly educated, socially prominent people in order to conduct the work of the church and have a successful work. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we need more spiritually minded people. People who are centered upon studying, learning, and obeying the Bible, not the books of secular education. In our first Corinthians chapter one again, in uh, verse 29 and 31, he talks, finishing what he said in verse 28, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Jesus Christ, as he says here in verse 30, he is our wisdom, he is our righteousness, he is our sanctification, he is our redemption, found only in Jesus Christ, not in the philosophies of man, modern or ancient. We need to turn to the word of God. Make sure that we're not putting human wisdom but where do we spend most of our time as Christians? Seeking the wisdom of God through his word or seeking the wisdom of man through whatever medium that wisdom might be imparted? We spend an awful lot of time with our cell phones and watching television. I'm convinced that if an epistle was written by the Apostle Paul to the church today, that television and cell phones would be in there somewhere warning us about how much time we spend with those mediums of information and condemning that because we're allowing those things to replace what time we should be spending with God's Word, receiving the sanctification and the redemption of righteousness and the wisdom that is in Jesus Christ. And making sure in our life that we make the changes that need to be made in spending more time studying the Word of God and gaining His wisdom because we'll gain much more wisdom and as a result much more happiness and spiritual success in every area of life success by studying God's word more so than spending time watching television or spending time getting information on our cell phone but a third reason why they were known for their carnality is that they made distinctions based upon class they made distinctions based upon a level of education, as we've already talked about, or a level of wealth, a level of prosperity, maybe their personality. They, they were making class distinctions in reference to different things that Paul says are not worthy 
of our concern and certainly not worthy of our exaltation. When we talk about the prominent members of the church, they should be the ones who are the most spiritually minded, the ones who are the hardest workers, the ones who are the most humble, are the ones who should be highly esteemed among us. And we should take our minds and our thoughts and our high estimations off of those who might be wealthier or off of those who might be more socially uh, prominent and off of those who might have the greatest personality and focus on the need for us as individuals to be humble and um, submissive to God and spiritually minded rather than worldly minded. So this is uh, one area that's a problem with the church in Corinth. They were carnally minded in the exalted man, they exalted human wisdom, and they divided the church into these different classes, distinguishing one and honoring one over the other, which, as I said, is a problem with every congregation, both during the time of Paul and also during our time here in the 21st century. Something we need to make sure that we're not looking at as individuals, or as a church. Where is our mind? Where is our focus? It should not be on material or carnal things, but on spiritual things. Let's get away from measuring our success or our prominence or our uh, work based upon human standards, but on the standard of God's work, which is not based upon numbers or popularity or power, but based upon spirituality and humility in serving and obeying God. Another area of problem and difficulty that the church in Corinth had, besides their carnality, was immorality. And when I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, we're going to be talking about the problems of the church in Corinth. The immorality was probably uh, the one that came to your mind most. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles. That a man has his father's wife. You could also turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and look at verses 9 through 20 where he goes into some detail talking about how that their focus was on fleshly things, sexual morality they were honoring, for example. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse uh, 13. Here Paul was talking about their estimation, how they figured things. He says, food for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then make the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who has joined your harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The influence of the church can be ruined in a particular community because of immorality, as it indicates there in chapter 5 and verse 1. He says that there was a sin going on there that was not even named among the Gentiles. And you can imagine what the reputation of the church there in Corinth would be if the community found out that they're committed to sin and even the Corinthians are not guilty of. So he's warning them that your influence in the church can be hindered greatly when you put up with immorality. That's what these people were doing. Again, Paul does not focus on the sin of immorality itself. And we don't really know what that was. It just says as a man had his father's wife. Some people have assumed that some woman who is not a Christian, who is not part of the church, married the son of a man that she had been divorced from. The son being a member of the church there, because he's the one that they had to withdraw themselves from 
Doesn't say anything about the woman that was involved here, so she apparently was not even a member of the church, but the son was. And he was living, as Paul said, with his father's wife. Maybe him, she had divorced. We don't really know what the details were. But it was a sin that Paul condemned and warns him that your reputation is going to be hindered. The church, however, did not warn. And this gets into the point that Paul's making. He focuses on how they dealt, dealt with this problem of immorality. They should have mourned. They should have been sad. They should have been uh, embarrassed and gotten rid of the problem as soon as possible. But in fact, they were puffed up, puffed up with pride, as he says here. Read there in verse 2 of chapter 5. In reference to the sin that he named there, he says, And you are puffed up. And have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed as absent in body of the present in spirit have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that this spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. This is very tough language on the part of the Apostle Paul and teach them how they need to deal with this example of immorality. How were they puffed up? Why were they glorified in that? I have no idea that that sounds perverted. But in some way, Paul identifies their sin in handling this. It made them puffed up and made them proud. They were boasting in some way or another. Maybe because uh, this person was prominent in the church. And they figured if they brought attention to that problem and withdrew from them and marked him, delivered him over to Satan, as Paul said, it might divide the church. It would ruin everything if we try to attack this prominent brother. That might have been it. They might have been afraid that the church would divide us, thinking that, well, everything's going great. We're growing. Uh, we have all these blessings. We don't want to spoil the, the, uh, the apple part here. We're just going to let it ride. So we don't really know what was the background. That's why they do not handle the situation. But Paul condemns their being puffed up and being proud of this. We don't really know why. Could have been any number of reasons as we've indicated. But Paul uses tough language and his purpose in using that tough language was to bring that sinful brother to repentance and also in order to help the church maintain their spiritual purity. Same is true today. How many examples of immorality have existed in certain individual local churches that have not been dealt with for a variety of reasons. But whatever the reasons were, it was going to be bad for the church because a sinful person would not be brought to repentance and the church's purity would be uh, compromised. They would not stand pure in God's eyes as Jesus intends according to first to our Ephesians chapter 5. He also points out, as we read there from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, that fornication is not for man. These people had apparently reasoned that, well, fornication is okay. This brother is guilty of immorality, fornication. We're going to let it ride because we figure like this. The food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. When a person gets hungry, he eats food. That's the way God intended it. And I think that's, that's true. God intended that our food be for uh, our stomach and our stomach for food. That one doesn't make sense without the other. And they said, since man has a desire to have sex, then I guess any way he wants to have sex is be okay. It's part of God's plan. And then Paul goes on to crush that particular reasoning. And he ends up by saying, flee sexual morality. He says that uh, our bodies and our spirits are God's. They belong to God. We're supposed to use our spirit and our bodies to glorify God, not to glorify the sex, and certainly not to glorify the sins of the flesh. Our bodies belong to God. We've been brought, brought with a price, as he says here. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And just like in the Old Testament, the temple of Solomon, he built there, was not to be misused or profaned, 
And so let us maintain the sanctity of our bodies, which are, as described here, the temples of the Holy Spirit. We have several other, at least one I thought was one of the problems there in Corinth I was going to address today. But I'm going to skip over it for the time being and pick it up in the sermon next Sunday because our time is, is already up. But I want to conclude the lesson with a passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians I think is appropriate. As we observe any of these sins and problems that the church in Corinth had. Because they were not following this admonition that Paul gives toward the end of First Corinthians. And it's something that we need to be reminded of as well. He says there in uh, let's see if I can find it. I guess I just have to read it. Well, my show, I guess, by the way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's what the church in Corinth needed over and over again, and that's what you and I need today, to make sure that our faith is in Jesus Christ, that our hope and our trust is in Jesus Christ. So that we'll be steadfast, so that we'll be un immovable, always abounding, not in the works of the flesh, not in the works of carnality, not in our problems, whatever they might be, but abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's focus on that, so that the church here in Chester will not emulate the problems and the issues that the church in Corinth had, in, not just in terms of problems, because we're going to have problems, maybe even the same problems that they had. But our focus is to be on how to deal with those problems in a scriptural way. So Paul's tough language applies to us just as it did to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15 58, that's also a pretty tough challenge to live up to. If you think about it and apply it in our lives, it will cover all that we do. And we'll see how everything that we do, our behavior, our thoughts, our actions, our attitude, can be altered for the better if we apply 1 Corinthians 15 58. Pick up your hymn books at this time and turn to the number that's been selected with a song of encouragement. It's to the work. And this hymn is based upon 1 Corinthians 15 58. And the work we need to do is spiritual, oriented from God and designed by God. And it's a work that we need to concentrate on and address ourselves to on a daily basis. So as a Christian, as a member of this church, if you're not to the work as you should be, as 1 Corinthians 15, 58 points out, our invitation we conclude the lesson is to become more perfect in doing the work of God. And if you need help in doing that, we'll be glad to go to God in prayer for you that your soul might be made right with God and your, your intentions of doing it right will be more focused when you leave the building this morning. With these thoughts on mind, let us now stand and sing this hymn.